in this edition of the Mike On Podcast. Two weeks after President Bola Tinubu came into power, it seems the former Lagos governor and senator is not leaving the task of governance to chance. His hands are seen and felt in different key areas of the nation. What could have been a slow start, as was the case in the last administration? For Mr. President has seen the implementation of policies, new appointments, silent bills into law, and the suspension of MFLA and Mr. Bauer. In another twist of event, an ex-militant leader, Asari Dokubo, dropped a bombshell when he visited the state house. He accused the Nigerian military of perpetrating the crime of oil theft, specifically pointing accusing fingers at the Nigerian army and the navy. He says they are responsible for 99% of oil theft in Nigeria. In a swift rebuttal to Asari Dokubo's accusation, the Nigerian Navy has told him to name the oil thieves. Who are these oil thieves? And with a lot already happening in just a few days in power, is the president getting his priorities right? John Shion Okimbaloi as he digs deeper into these issues with a host of seasoned guests on the Micom Podcast. The 60% of Us series. Hello everyone, welcome to the MyCon Podcast. I'm Sean Joaquin Balloy. This podcast, you're not just a listener. You can have the mic at any time. This is uh, an intervention, uh, an addition to my uh, program on channels television, uh, Politics Today and Sunday, Politics on Sunday at 8 p.m. Just to allow nigerians to have the opportunity to engage in a robust conversation about the progress of our nation the policy of government and to also have citizens converse in a way that is civil and that will bring progress to our land well since president tunubu took oath of office to lead africa's most populous democracy president bola tunubu has kept his foot on the accelerator suspensions, signing of bills to law, appointments. The decisions are coming at an interesting pace and it's hard to tell what is coming. Right or wrong, his decisions, as expected, are producing spiraling effect and getting Nigerians talking. The suspension of Mr. Godwin Emefiele, the governor of the CBN, as uh, well as uh, Mr. Abdurashid Bauer, the chairman of the EFCC, uh, two major decisions and clear signals that Nigerians are in for a very eventful ride with his administration. The array of visits that we have seen recently under presidential villa and the state house have also been quite interesting. Former Niger Delta militant Elijah Asari Dokubo was at the state house and made his visit even more newsworthy by dropping a weighty allegations. He alleged that 99% of oil theft and bunkering in the Niger Delta region were carried out by the Nigerian military, specifically the Army and the Navy. The Nigerian Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, NITI, disclosed that Nigeria lost 619.7 million barrels of crude oil worth 16.25 trillion or $46.16 billion from 2009 to 2020 to oil theft. So, the fact that oil is stolen in Nigeria in huge quantity may not be a typical breaking news content, but an allegation that those who are supposed to guard against theft are responsible for the crime is damning and worth looking into. On this edition of the podcast, we will be considering all the sides of this developing story. We will be also uh, trying to attempt an assessment of the president's actions so far. The legal angle, the security angle, and the political angle. And so, welcome everyone. Let me uh, introduce you to the panelists on this podcast today. To give us some security perspectives, is the executive director of uh, uh, next year, uh, in, um, Dr. Undu Unwokolo. Thank you so much for joining us. He's a security consultant. Thank you so much indeed for, for coming on the podcast. And I have a lawyer and a rights activist, Mr. Uh, 
F. Young, who is uh, joining us from Lagos. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Inibehe F. Young, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you. And politically speaking, and giving some political science perspective to this, is Mr. Kaede Ogundamisi, is joining us from London. Thank you so much, Mr. Ogundamisi, for your time. I think it seems you're muted. Can you hear me now? Mr. Ogundamisi? All right. So let's get going. Uh, let me begin first and foremost uh, from the point of view. I think I can hear you now. Oh, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. It's good to see you again, Mr. Ogunamisi. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thank you so much. Mr. Wokolo, when someone like Mr. Asari Dokubo goes to the presidential villa, address the press conference after meeting with the president, and lay a weighty allegations. I mean, don't let us get it wrong. This is not the first time we're hearing about allegations similar to this. But saying it after meeting the president, laying the allegations on the doorstep of the military, the Nigerian Navy and the Army, what does this mean? So well, I think uh, it meant a lot of things. First, one need to understand that um, Asari Dokobo first does not even have the moral standard to to say what he's saying or how many people are going to believe him or believe him outside what we know already. Now, from the point of people like um, who understand the Niger Delta, who have done some studies in the Niger Delta, of which someone like me, I, my PhD is on the Niger Delta, is a value chain. Now, I remember, Asari Dokobo once, or to date, still have the Niger Delta People's Volunteer Force, which everybody knows that there were a lot of militant leaders who were involved in a lot of things, including kidnapping, illegal oil bunkering, and so on and so forth. While these things were going on, he benefited from it as well. So, from the 1990 when he dropped from university till date, he worked millions. So he cannot be accusing the military or the army from something that he's a part and parcel. Does it mean that the allegation is wrong or right? May not actually be wrong, but there is a, a kind of overgeneralization to say that 99% is being done by uh, the let, military. So let, let's get a few uh, issues right. From your understanding of the magnitude of oil theft that we have seen in this country today, are there elements within the military? Because saying that the military as a whole here is, is responsible, I'm not sure how correct that could be. But uh, is there a possibility that there are connivances in the Nigerian army and in the navy? And he also said there are some cabars, which may include highly placed persons in the society. Is this a possible? Is it a fact? So well, let me ask you the question. Does Nigeria know the amount of oil that are being produced every day? So the issue is not even about looking at it. It's not as simple as we are looking at it. So that's why I said it's a value chain. It includes the, the, the oil companies. What they declare every day as in the production that we have. Are we really sure that that's what? So... If we want to look at this, it's, it's interconnected and there's a lot of um, argument around who and who is involved. Of which, if you look at it, now, is it equally important for us to understand that most times people think, okay, they are the oil communities are involved. Yes, whatever they may be involved might be where pipelines are broken, people go to a kind of scoop, whatever thing that is left out of it. For that amount of, you know, oil, for us to be losing that amount of quantity of oil every day, yes, it, one could argue that it cannot be something that is not done from a commercial perspective of which a lot of people would have involved. So my argument is, the military may be involved, but other 
other people within the value chain are equally involved, including people who are foot soldiers. Maybe involved. So it's a racket. It's a racket. It's an industry. On it's an own. industry which includes people like, you know, people like well-meaning people from the, the from the region, the region. as well. Yes. So people make a lot of money from it. Exactly. I don't know if you've seen the the documentary produced by China's television. A colleague of mine, uh, Olu Phillips, uh, um, who was on that story, and he, he did a lot of work on that, spent several weeks looking into it. In fact, there there is a pipe that is not of the NNPC pipeline that is as old as nine years yes. or ten years. Yeah. That means this is... Uh, this is a racket that has been on for several. And the amount of crude that is being said to have been stolen is not something that could easily also be taken away from the shores of Nigeria just like that. Let me bring Mr. Um, uh, Kaudi Ogunamisi into it. To it uh, and I'll then go back to Mr. Enibe to give us a legal perspective to all of this. Mr. Ogunamisi, you pointed out something uh, in your tweet, which I saw, uh, which I felt like, was interesting about the visit of Mr. Uh, Asari Dokubo. I mean, you don't seem to be in agreement with the manner in which he went about his press conference. Uh, thank you, Sheo. Uh, let me first um, speak directly to uh, the brave men and women serving our, um, in our armed forces. Uh, let me send my solidarity to a lot of them, uh, many who are fighting and confronting Boko Haram and the northern part of the, the country. Uh, many who sacrifice their life and get to lose their lives across our nation uh, under very difficult circumstances, um, poorly paid, uh, vilified by every section of the country as if uh, it is those men and women of the uh, armed forces that are the problem of Nigeria. Let me just say to them that the views of Mr. Dokubo uh, does not represent the general view of uh, Nigerians. Uh, he speaks for himself to, to just generalize and say 99% of um, uh, men and women of the armed forces are involved in oil bunkering. Uh, that is not to say that there are no bad elements in, within the armed forces, just like there are very extremely bad elements within the media uh bad elements within the the civil service bad elements within non-governmental organizations who collect billions of dollars uh, naira from across the world uh, uh conflict preneurs so to hit the blame of a crisis uh, uh within a region on the military is quite unfortunate secondly to use the state of government to vilify uh, uh, uh brave men and women is uh, is something I'll just say to the Tinubu administration to be uh, mindful of. Uh, when you get into government, you have all these fear, all these new friends come in and say all manner of stuff. Uh, in our country, we have a national security apparatus, and if Mr. Dukupo, Dukupo really means well for the country, you wonder how come he has not provided this uh, information to to the different uh, uh, elements, and how come this is the first time he's talking about this? Everyone knows that the uh, oil bunkering in the Niger Delta cuts across the different elements in the Niger Delta. I have been to Arubuijo, uh, and I will say this openly: the Oba uh, in in my side of um, uh, the, the just side of Gondo, you know, uh, we 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 had a visit, and you could see some ex-militia, and you know that even traditional rulers are involved. So, like the uh, the other guests did say, it's a it's a it's a it's a cooperation of criminal elements across different sectors of the countries who are draining on our natural resources. So, my point about giving the Kubo the platform, whether it's, it doesn't matter whether it's a coat of arm or whether it's the seal of the of the uh, of the presidency the fact that you have someone sitting on a platform where we've had policy decisions being dictated on that same platform is on, is uncalled for so i'll further advise the current administration that they will probably need to redesign another press center where non-government officials will be able to just sort of um, uh, give information about what they've had with the presidency just uh, just uh, imagine if a buari had for example 
uh, invite uh, uh, repentant Boko Haram uh, uh, militias into the presidency, and they are they are giving the, the optics of them sort of giving out information, you know, uh, within the villa. Uh, under those circumstances, you know, it, it's not something that I think the current government should um, should encourage, and that is my position. Also, to say that we cannot also dismiss the importance of people like Dokubo, Tompola, and all the other ex militias that we need them in finding a solution to this crisis. But in needing them to find a solution to this crisis, the government must, the, the, must um, devise a strategy of engaging with them without sending a, a message as if this is a partnership, you know, uh, and that is left for the current administration to, to, um, to decide. And finally, uh, that is not to say that I'm not. I, I am more than pleasantly surprised at the the speed in which this current government is going, and I hope they sustain it. But it's just that it needs to be mindful. Mm. So l l let me quickly say this, and let's clear because this oil theft matter. I I opened the program uh, to give some statistics on the amount of crude that has been stolen. So if you amount, yeah. and if you put those figures together. And look at what those figures in terms of money can do to our economy is going to be huge. But, uh, Mr. Ogunda Misi, what Asari Dokubo said at the villa, a lot of people will say it is not new. We've heard it before. For example, go former governor of River State, Nisan Wike, had accused a general officer commanding the 6th Division of the Nigerian Army of running an oil theft ring. In the state, this is a, was a sitting governor accusing the head of the military in that region of spearheading of running an oil theft ring. So someone will say, "What Asari Dokubo is saying is not new. That this is a huge racket. That some elements in the military, some cabals who are highly placed, are terribly involved in." Of course, it is not new, and I'm. You know, before we had the the, the former president, uh, uh, Mr. Tinumbu, President Tinumbu's um, immediate uh, this criticism uh, seems to have a lot of let the institutions run by itself. You're hoping that with this new commander in chief, uh, that actions will be taken when informations are given in terms of who is doing what uh, amongst the tax force members and. The Navy did a very important response to Mr. Dukupo's allegation as a who name them. They must have names. You know, they must have uh, positions where they have been. And you also ask the questions, when these uh, so-called members of the armed forces, these minority members, when they make money from uh, uh, oil theft, or when other members of the community make important money from oil, where did they take the money to? They, 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 where do ter terrorists keep money? They keep them in banks. So this is just spread across these different institutions. So hopefully with the current administration, I'm putting a big important hopefully, that questions will be asked, you know, and it will be specific questions about who is doing what, when, how, where are they keeping the money? And uh, if you look at most of the, uh, uh, most of, most of the uh, important documentaries coming out, out of the Niger Delta, you see people within the community doing the direct oil bunkering. You don't see a military man who is uh, 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 busting the pipe. So you know that there's a collaboration between the criminal elements and so-called members of the uh, of the of the community. Now we ask the final question: Didn't we pay Tumpolo uh, several millions of uh, of naira to to get some of these resources? Uh, what are the gains from these millions of, uh, of naira that we were given to the to, to Tompolo? Are we, aren't we paying several millions of, of naira to ex-militants who claim to uh, get amnesty and to to uh, stop bunkering? So, I think this this this, this strategy of heaping all the blames on the military is a distraction. You know, it, it, it it's, it's just something to to eat the blame away from the people who are doing the the, the oil test. And Mr. Dokubo knows the elements within the Niger Delta that are involved in, 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 in oil bunkering. And they are his associates, his comrades, people who were in the Niger Delta struggle uh, before now. So this is this is a strategy for, for distraction. And 
actionable intelligence and information are things that should be handled by the different uh, the, by the organs of government that are tasked with the responsibility of delivering on on saving our natural resources so now let me bring in mr inibe into the conversation and let me put some perspective to each everyone the average production of oil crude in nigeria between January 20, 2002 and February 2023 is about 1.9 million barrels per day. Now, this is the average of oil, the crew that is being stolen mm -hmm. per day in Nigeria, about 600,000. Yeah. So, it, if we are producing less than 2 million barrels and about 600,000 is being stolen, add 600,000 to what we produce, we are probably losing... Uh, maybe 40 percent of yeah or about 30 something percent of the entire uh, production that we have per day mr Effian, give me your own understanding from the legal point of view from a moral point of view what is really going on in this country when you have the scenario that we that played out in the villa with mr sarido kubo uh, although it's the, the, the right thing that he, what he said Put in correctly, he says 99% of the oil theft uh, is being done by um, the military people in the Navy and the Army. Not 99% um, of the military are involved in oil theft. So, uh, give us an understanding of your own perspective to this. Well, I first and foremost, I am a citizen of Nigeria from the Niger Delta region. I come from Akwaibom State, one of the leading oil producing states in the country. Uh, and, and therefore, I am directly connected to the issue under consideration. Now, my perspective to this is a bit different. I, I do not believe that the wanton oil theft the present oil theft in the Niger Delta region would be possible without the complicity, without the participation of the Nigerian Armed Forces, the Navy in particular. I do not believe that for a second. I was in the House of Representatives uh, a few years back, I think about three years ago, to present a matter on behalf of a client before the House of Reps Committee on Public Petitions. While the House of Reps Committee was looking into my matter, I was opportune to witness a petition by a female military personnel who had petitioned the committee to say that she was victimized um, almost raped and then wrongly chased out of the military on account of a whistle blowing where she in which she implicated some of her superiors in the military in all bunkering the evidence was overwhelming and it was obvious that the nigerian army had no defense to the petition the lady uh, military personnel had brought against them. So that is just one example. I have also been privy to uh, disclosures of record by people um, who may be connected one way or the other with the military, either saving personnel or past personnel, who have also shared their opinion on this matter. First and foremost, and more importantly, I, I, I think it will be a bit... Uh, uh, you know, on serious, to put it mildly, for anyone to assume that the grand theft of oil in the Niger Delta would have been possible if the army is not complicit. That would mean that the entire architecture of the Nigerian Navy and the Nigerian army in particular is incompetent, ineffective, and has lost relevance. I would not believe that vandals 
or those who engage in all bunkering within the region, whether from the Niger Delta or, or elsewhere, will successfully carry out all thefts in the manner in which we have seen from the statistics rolled out by the government itself at the soldiers and the naval personnel who are deployed to guard all uh, facilities and the installations have not been compromised. If they are not involved in this illicit or bunkering, illicit uh, trade, this will not be happening. So if the argument is that they are not involved, then we must say that they are incompetent. And therefore, the government must also accept responsibility for what is happening. Now, we had a, a president for eight years, Buhari, who allotted to himself the position of Minister of Petroleum. And then he says, of course, he's a retired Major General. And one would have thought that with experience in the armed forces and being the, the president who has assumed the position of Minister of Petroleum Resources for eight years, that all thefts would have been addressed. But what we saw was a man who, in January 2023, was giving a baseless and ridiculous marching orders to the military to end all bunkering in the Niger Delta after eight years of colossal failure. The point I am making is that we have a way of shifting responsibility from where it is supposed to lie. And my view is that whether we are saying that the army is not directly involved or that the army is directly involved or that the army is incompetent because that is going to be the implication that the armed forces of nigeria is competent it lacks the personnel it lacks the leadership it lacks the capacity and the might to stop all theft in the niger delta it still boils down to failure of leadership it boils down to failure of governance because in eight years, Tinubu, Mr. Tinubu has just uh, started his own, uh, you know, uh, controversial journey. But in the eight years of the Buhari regime, I would like you to tell me how many senior members of the armed forces were sanctioned on account of the oil theft in the Niger Delta. So nobody, I, I agree with Asari Dukubo. I don't know about percentage, whether it is 99%, but I do agree with him that all theft in the region will not be possible if the military and the armed forces is not involved. But however, what, what is curious is the man that is making this advocacy and the platform that he has been offered. Uh, Asai Nukubo, as far as today is concerned, to the average person in the Niger Delta, is just pursuing his own personal egoistic interest. I do not see him as someone that is fighting for me, as someone from the Niger Delta. It may be during his days in the Niger Delta, you know, struggle, you know, people in the Niger Delta would have been sympathetic to his cause. But today, I do not see Asari Dukubo as that voice of conscience from the region. So whatever reckless, whatever irresponsible, whatever, you know, sensational commentaries he's making, is just to ingratiate himself, you know, into the Tunubu Cabal, that is essentially what it's about. And it is actually very embarrassing that Tunubu will allow Atari Dukubo to address the country from the villa with the coat of arms of the Nigerian state behind him. Uh, and you could see the confidence in which he spoke. So whatever funny games they are playing, it is left for time to unfold, to reveal. Mm. But let me be understood mm. very clearly. Mm. My view is that I do agree in principle that all theft will not be possible in the manner, in the level, the dimension in which it is taking place as confirmed by the statistics of the government itself had the armed forces not been complices or incompetent. So, I mean, you are you, uh, the lawyer here, Mr. Uh, Effion, and I'd like you to help us clarify this. So, the Navy responded and perhaps given some legal perspective that uh, on the principle of he who asserts must prove. And they said, if Asari Dokubo is seeking some form of relevance and he alleges that there are cabals of the military personnel who are involved in crude oil, oil theft, let him bring the names. He said, they said that the chief of defense staff does not condone that, nor does the chief of naval staff under women serve. That is uh, the spokesperson of the Navy in the statement and said, 
excuse me, the Nigerian Navy as an organization is actively involved in the fight against crude oil theft and the resources in the Niger, Niger, Niger Delta. So for anybody to say there is a cabal of military officers, the only simple thing is bring the evidence, bring the names. That is what uh, Mr. <coughs> Commodore Ayovon said in the statement. What do you make of that response coming from the Navy? Baseless and diversionary. I, I, I think they take Nigerians for granted. They are not talking to children. What evidence are they? Are they the, 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 the evidence is before us. The evidence that is before us is the statistics that all of us can speak to. In 2018 alone, 53.28 million barrels of crude oil vanished from Nigeria in 2018 alone. And then 90, right, the Nigerian Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative stated that in 2019, Nigeria lost 42.25 million barrels of oil, of crude oil, to oil theft, valued at $2.77 billion. In 2020, crude oil losses from oil thefts and sabotage amounted to $1.63 billion right i can keep rolling out these you know figures in april 2022 the gmd of nnpc limited melayare disclosed that nigeria lost four billion dollars to oil theft at the rate of 200 000 barrels per day in 2021 so with this this statistics is the evidence it, because it is it is embarrassing it is scandalous it is even utterly insulting for the for them to issue a statement and say bring evidence when the government zone statistics has shown the level of all theft in the region so if they are not complicit in the criminality they must now tell us why they have not resigned they must now tell us what investigation they have carried out to unravel those who are involved they must now tell us the resources that have been devoted that have been budgeted to stop all theft what has been done with the resources let us have the 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 the, the the reports of what they have done with the money that the government has made available to them in the last eight years of Bari. Let's even leave, you know, the last uh, few weeks aside. So you cannot say you are not involved in the criminality and you have been given the funds, you have been given the resources, you have the, the personnel, you have the power to stop the theft and you have not stopped it and you have not sanctioned those that you have delegated to stop it and you are not admitting to your failure, you have not resigned. This people just take us for fools. They take us for fools because we are so used to accepting the indefensible. I don't take what that you know the the position of the Nava spokesperson seriously. And I don't think. Look, I come from the Niger Delta, and we know the truth of the matter. We can't pretend about this. Any person from the Niger Delta knows that all theft is not possible in the Niger Delta if the military is not involved. And I will say this before anybody. It is simply impossible. And if you are saying that you want the video, let us be video of naval personnel or military personnel directly engaging in all theft or giving security cover to those who are involved in all bunkering. Is that the evidence they are looking for? Well, if that evidence is not available, how about the evidence of the statistics of the theft itself? What is their response to that? What will they tell us is responsible for this theft. And are they saying they are so inefficient that the entire military personnel, the entire forces of Nigeria, the their intelligence departments, they are not able to investigate or not those who are involved? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Let, let me, it is just one plus one. Yeah. If you are not involved in the theft, are you covering up those who are involved? If you are not covering them up, why have you not arrested them? If you have not arrested them and you are not involved, and it means you are inefficient, why have you not resigned? These are the questions that we must ask them. So I, I would not regard such a response as anything serious. Let me bring in uh, Dr. Nwokolo back. Uh, how possible is it on our waters that about 600,000 barrels of crude stolen every day is being shipped out of this country? Uh, what? I mean, what does it look like? 600,000 barrels. It is not just two jerry cans. It is not one truckload. It is a whole lot of crude 
that is being taken and on the same channel that everyone can see on our waters being monitored by security agencies in the country. What exactly, how could it be possible? Okay, let me go back to the first background I, I tried to give. And I, I like what Barry Sepion tried to say. But it's important for us to understand that the failure we are looking at here is not just the failure of Nigerian military. It's a <laughs> failure of the Nigerian state. Now, in every same country where things work very well, my question would have been, what is the DSS doing? Does it mean that part of their work is internal security? They provide those intelligence around security. So does it mean that the Department for State Security does not know about this? How come they've not reported that the Nigerian military are the ones this, perpetrating this crime? That's on one side. Again, secondly, the Constitution empowered the Defense Corps to guide and protect Nigerian critical infrastructure, which includes the pipeline. So how come that part of our security architecture is not working? Now, let's go to the military. Because what I, I, I was trying to say here is that there's a lot of, you know, moral economy around on your theft, which we are, we are, when we make all these arguments, we try to overlook them. If you look at uh, Asari Dekobo yesterday, you could see a man who was talking from a point of moral, moral economy of oil theft. Why? It's like, oh, you're coming to our place to steal oil. Why we are not stealing? Or why you've stopped us from stealing? And that was why I said there's a value chain around this. So, because it's a cabal, probably you are part of the part of part and parcel of the military that have been stealing. Now you're no longer part of it. So you've not turned around to say they've been stealing. Were you stealing before? And now you can't steal again. So take it back to your question. I did ask, do we actually know the quantity of oil that is being produced every day? Most of these things are projection. The country cannot even tell us that they have the right technology like every other oil producing country to say that this day, 16th or 17th of June, uh, June 2023, that 2,000 barrels of oil, you know, were extracted. We do not even have that kind of technology. So most of these things are projection. So we've projected that this is what we're going to get in a day. And then we may, we, whether we calculate rightly or wrongly, we will not say this is the amount of oil that have been stolen. So for me, I still believe that the amount that we are being quoted include the ones that the the, the um, international oil companies have not even declared. And then to your question, it would be highly impossible for those number of um, barrels, you know, to leave the shores of Nigeria without the Navy knowing about it, mm -hmm. without the Mesa knowing about it. So that's what I, why I come back to say you cannot blame the military alone. It's a value chain. A lot of people are involved. How does the government of the day, which is just about three weeks old, break that chain? Is it possible? Or it's, is it an impossible task? So it's possible. And the only way it's possible is for the, the, for the, for the government to be very transparent about his action. Which, from some of the things they are doing now, you can say yes. Now, if you dis if when President um, Tinubu decides to appoint the next minister of petroleum, and now give it to somebody who understands the region, who understands the industry, who understands that the country is as poor as anything, that we need the all the right amount of money. And then to bring all the stakeholders on board. Now, remember why I equally argue about the the moral economy of oil theft. The Niger Delta region, we've not done the things we are supposed to do. So, because most times, because of the terrain in that area, you need those people to equally give you a point as to where things are happening. So, um, it's not something you can only do because you, you need to make some pronouncement. These are the part of the things you need to do because you're bringing all of them involved, in, including uh, uh, folks like uh, Sarit Dakobo. You still need him. 
He still need Tompolo. He still need everybody on board to be able to have this thing sorted out. Mm. So we're having, the government is saying in a few months, some of the refineries that are being fixed will come on stream. Tangote refinery is going to come on, come on stream. And if you see the quota of uh, production, Saudi Sea, Saudi Arabia Sea tops in terms of the number of crude that is being produced, but Nigeria still has less than 2 million barrels per day. And this has gone on for several several months, uh, uh, even or years. Now, the question is, uh, revenue is a major problem. And I mean, either this government likes it or not, it needs to still fix the oil and gas industry. There is the removal of subsidy. There is a thinking of alternatives. And uh, speaking with some uh, petroleum expert who said, look, the oil, the oil industry is a big cartel. It's a, a big, a big industry that a lot of uh, deep-pocketed people are involved in. And those who are doing the subsidy racket, there's a lot of money that is involved because uh, Nigeria pays a whole lot of money for this subsidy, but they take uh, this subsidy, uh, this uh, this product, take it outside of the country to sell because it is profitable, and they get more than two three hundred uh percent of uh, profit on, on 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 the on the on, on the product that nigeria is subsidi subsidizing i mean uh, revenue problem if nigeria is not careful is going to ruin this country if we don't fix how we can generate uh revenue from your own point of view uh where do we start from there is the massa uh there is uh, the nigeria navy there is the nscdc all of these agencies, where can they start from to getting it right? This racket, how can they be broken down? First, you will start from, let me, uh, I know Kola is going to talk about this. Both of us are political scientists, we're going to talk about this now. Countries where things work are countries where government, government as a caretaker for the state does its responsibility independent of the other institutions in the state. If you watch what is going on in the states, in the in the United States now, former President Trump is being tried. You could see that as as he fights to say that whatever the Department of Justice are doing, or that they are doing the bid or the bidding of um of President Biden, represented by the White House, you could see the White House trying to say it's not our business. The Department of Justice is doing their own thing. We are not interested in what they are doing. Now, you could see that there is no a kind of collaboration in terms of to drag former President Trump down between the White House, which is the current U.S. government, and the Department of Justice. Now, bring it to our own situation. A situation where the government of the day is as transparent as possible in its dealings is going to rub on, on the military, which we know that if the government is transparent, they're going to come hard on us, or the other agencies of the state will come hard on us if we have found one thing. The same with the police, the same with the DSS, the same with the NEMESA, the same with the Ministry of Petroleum, the same with the Ministry of Niger Delta, Development, uh, Niger Delta Affairs. Now, these are institutions of the state. So once government on its own is as transparent as possible and is not involved because the situation where these other agencies of the state or institutions of the state knows that the government of the day, which is Asu Rock or Asu Villa, represented by President Tinibu and people around him, are part of parcel of what is happening in the Niger Delta because one way or the other, Patrimonialism or prebendalism is happening within the corridors of power and is rubbing on on what is happening in, in the oil sector. Then those of them who are in the military who have been charged to protect those critical polit um, petroleum assets will be involved because why should people in the villa could be conniving to steal oil and will be allowing them to steal? I will steal myself. That's what you're going to see. All right. Uh, let me bring in because a lot love us to talk touch on the Bauer, the MFLA situation. These are major decisions that shape the 
very first three weeks of the Tinubu presidency, uh, Mr. Ogunamisi, a political way to look at is, or what way do we go in terms of President Tinubu and this administration tackling this issue of, uh, of, uh, of oil theft? Because if the Navy is talking, shouldn't the president be meeting the Navy immediately or his chief of defense staff over this matter? If this has emerged from uh, the villa on Friday, Or whatever is going on within the villa i would be surprised if uh, the presidency has not uh, been having conversations with the navy and with the um, uh, military architecture in terms of what is happening in the nigeria military, based on the information given by uh, mr dokubo and the president also even before dokubo came in also highlighted the importance of safeguarding um, our facilities. I just wanted to also quickly, you know, sometimes we need to be careful in terms of the kind of task we we uh, we, we shoulder onto our security service. For example, you ask yourself, what's the number of uh, police men and women we have in the country, and we expect them to perform this kind of miracle that they're going to protect lives of and property. In most cases, almost sixty percent of these men and women. Uh, have been allocated to act as um, as batmen, uh, aide de camp for um, music stars, for politicians and their and, and their and their family members. So the expectations are high. Then you go into the Niger Delta. Some state in the Niger Delta is probably the size of a country in Europe. You ask yourself, what is the size of the number of naval officers? or the number of uh, military men we have in the Niger Delta uh, to protect a uh, gas pipeline that run, that cuts across several countries, if those, if those states were in Europe. If there is a will to sabotage and community members are involved in sabotaging pipelines, if there is a will for local collaborators to uh, point them to where these uh, pipelines are, if there are international buyers bringing the ship into our, our coastal area and the military, like the uh, first your first guest said, it's a it's a it's a value chain, you know. So to think that there's this magic that you would have the military sort of stop this, you sort of asking lawyers to stop corruption in in the judiciary or you're asking civil servants to stop uh, 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 the massive uh, corruption that is going on within the civil service so there is a there is a mass inter inter uh, in, 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 inter you know interdependency on corruption that is going on across our country so it's not just the military it's in the government among citizens and we just have to look for a turnaround within ourselves that look we want a change so going into what uh, the president Tinubu needs to do is to just provide leadership if you look at how much we spend on providing new cars for people elected into a public office the vast amount of resources we spend on keeping people in, in, in government if we can just scale down on that, scale down on the on the vast amount of resources we spend on public officers, it will be exemplary. A policeman will see that there's a sacrifice being made by an elected official. Uh, the custom man who is in the border will see that there is a sacrifice being made by everybody. And then you sort of symbolically reduce the corruption in, in the society. And for Mr. Dokubo, you ask that question, apart from keeping this blame on the military, we already have a strategy in place where we're paying millions of dollars to uh, ex-militias to protect our pipeline. Are we asking them those questions? The answer is no. We are, we are, we are paying people millions of dollars almost on a monthly basis uh, just to stop bunkering, and they still continue. So it's a, it's a failure, it's a state failure, the state and which the federal government continues to be weak you know uh private militias continue to be powerful so it's not uh something that could be resolved by just thinking that you would have the military becoming the solution it's it's it's, 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 it's an holistic approach that we need to take all right uh mr Effiong, I'll, I'll quickly get your intervention on this the way forward uh beyond the rhetoric, there's a lot of 
nobody can there's no gainsaying on, on how much nigeria lose every day on this oil threat where do we go from here from your own point of view what must be done urgently i don't think tunubu has shown any seriousness to address the issues at, at this time uh, one can say it is still too early in the day uh, whether that is true or not it, it is left to be seen we have seen the areas of interest to him uh the suspension of uh, some key functionaries of government efcc and cbn the heads of those institutions anybody who has assumed presidential powers uh and then is generally committed to setting this country on a different direction should not occupy us for 24 hours without firing the very incompetent service chiefs that Buari retained in office. It, 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 it is simply, you know, uh, difficult to explain why we still have the chief of army staff, the chief of naval staff, the chief of air staff, the inspector general of police, the DG of SSS. Why we still have these persons in office, despite the wanton insecurity in the country, Despite the failures that we have witnessed, the plague that the Buhari regime had brought on the country, look at the, what they call the banditry. Shehun, the problem we have in Nigeria is the problem of impunity. I don't like Erufai. I don't like his personality or his attitude to governance, but he's an intelligent person. And there is one, one expression he once used, which I love to borrow always. He called it policy of consequence. Nigeria lacks the policy of consequence. The reason why these things pe persist, because I'm speaking to the way forward now, is that those who have responsibility, whether constitutional or administrative or executive or whatsoever, when they fail to discharge on their mandate, and there is no consequence for that failure, what you are doing is that you are reinforcing failure or incompetence, like you know, passenger would say. I don't understand why all that has become so problematic to the economy of the country, to the revenue generating capacity of Nigeria, to the security of the Niger Delta, to even the environmental devastation of my region. And yet, you have people that have a responsibility to address that, and they have failed. All we get is excuses. So if you really want to reposition the security architecture of the country, the moment you subscribe to oath of office and oath of allegiance, within 24 hours, you should have fired all of them. You should have fired all of them. Look at the antecedents. Look at, for example, the IG. Why is the IG still in office? Is tenure had expired? Why? Why? What is the IGP still doing? The Inspector General of Police. Leave the, the, the military for a second. Why do you still have the Inspector General of Police in office? Is it on account of any extraordinary performance or he was so incompetent? What, what is the basis for keeping him in office till now? What is the basis? Is it that he has reformed the police? Is it that he has stopped corruption in the police? Is it that he's so exceptional? Why are you retaining him? Because when you say the way forward, I can sit here and make all, all sort of postulations. In the final analysis, none of us is clothed with the power of the commander in chief, with presidential power, or even executive powers. I cannot appoint, I cannot fire, I cannot hire. So if you have people occupying sensitive positions in, in the country and they fail to discharge on their responsibilities and you don't send them packing, you don't fire them, what you are doing is that. You are telling Nigerians that you have to make failure an official policy of government. And that is why Buhari failed. Because he just did not have the capacity, the mental alertness to punish people who have failed to decide on their mandates. For me, that is the beginning. If you are coming in to bring change, right, from your, the first day you assume that office, they say, oh, a new sheriff. Because you, you are staying in the villa. At the end of the day, the military was on chains of command. The 
sergeants, the corporals, the captains, the lieutenants, they don't take instruction from the commander in chief. They have their heads, they are superiors. The commander in chief gives directive to the service chiefs and it goes down through the chain of command. So when you have the people heading these institutions and they have failed or nothing has been achieved significantly under them and you don't bring in new people, you don't fire them, we are wasting our time. But I conclude by saying that I do not believe as I speak to you that the Nigerian state is ready to address all the theft in the Niger Delta. It has become a very rewarding, a very enterprising, criminal, it has become, you know, a productive criminal enterprise, a rewarding criminal enterprise, both from some criminal elements within the region who are also profiting from this. And reference has been made to Tompolo who was given a contract. Who gave him the contract? It was very regime that sustained the contract. So has that contract been reviewed? Has it been revoked? So I, 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 I we must stop taking, accepting excuses from those that have a constitutional obligation to protect us. When people assume positions of leadership, what happens is what is called the social contract, right? What is called in, in political science, the leviathan, where we as citizens repose the right to self-rule on the leviathan, which is now represented by what is called the government. And in a representative democracy like us, where people, someone says, I am the president, I am a governor, and they are saying we have the mandate to take decisions on your behalf. What makes that significant is responsibility. The moment we stop apportioning responsibility on those that have the that are supposed to take responsibility, the entire social structure, the entire social construct will collapse. And that is why Nigeria has become an embarrassment to the world today because we have not come to terms as a country with a policy of consequence that when people say things when people do things there will be a price to pay otherwise what will make a senator bull Kachua, i'm just setting this as the reference to stay in the chambers of the senate and confess that his wife who was president of the court of appeal had accepted his overbearing influence to favor his colleagues because he knows nothing will happen. Because he knows nobody will be tried. Nobody will be arrested. And it is the same with the oil theft in Niger Delta. All we hear are statistics. Nobody is penalized. But, uh, nobody is held accountable. Yes, so the solution Mr. is same the solution is accountability. Let us see people punished for failure. Let us see people being fired for not discharging on their responsibilities. That is the only way to turn the country around. Mm. I wanted to ask you, you touched on something that, I mean, I discussed on channels and on politics today, and which was what Senator Bukichu has said on the floor. And I wanted to ask you, you uh, as a lawyer, uh, does Senator Bukichu, is it protected by some kind of immunity which covers him... Um, in the in the chamber as a lawmaker because what he said a lot of people have described it as a confessional statement do you think that legally speaking he has some kind of immunity that covers lawmakers from whatever they say on the floor yes he does if, if let's be you know objective about it under the legislative houses powers and privileges act of 2017 Comments made by uh, members of the Senate and the House of Representatives during the sitting and while in chambers uh, protected speech. It cannot result, you know, in a, either civil or, or criminal liability. So that immunity is there. However, because what is spoke to, I want to make a distinction between his comments on the floor of the Senate and the action that took place outside the floor of the Senate, which he only alluded to on the floor. It's not the same thing. While you cannot charge him merely on the basis, I don't believe he can be charged merely on the basis of what he uttered. Because in law, for you to prove any crime in law, two essential elements must be present. 
the actus reus, which is the act itself and the mens rea, or what we lawyers call the criminal intent. What is said, one can say that is the mens rea. The intention has been disclosed or the criminal intent has been spoken to publicly. But you must go further to also establish the actus reus, which is the act itself. If you must secure conviction, either for bribing a judicial officer or for corrupting or for perversion of justice, whatever the charge is going to be, it cannot, you cannot ground conviction. That offense will not be constituted in law, except investigation is done to unravel possible particular, there has to be particularity regarding the cases where this inducement may have taken place. There has to also be evidence on the manner in which this inducement was done. Who were the beneficiaries of this inducement? If these things I have mentioned are not proved beyond reasonable doubt, it will be difficult to secure conviction. That is the truth of the matter legally. So the question again is, does the Nigerian state as weak, as inefficient, as corrupt as it is today, does it have the institutional capability to carry out diligent investigation, which will be bring to fore these ingredients that I have mentioned, the things that I have said must be proved. Again, I want to say, so that I'm not misunderstood, that under the Legislative Powers and Privileges Act of 2017, National Assembly members and even other Assembly members cannot be sanctioned, mainly on the ways by the, on the basis of the ways that have altered during sittings inside the chamber. But where what they are speaking to relates to what took place outside the chambers, investigation can be carried out to unravel those acts that took place outside the chambers and where evidence is available, it can be prosecuted. And I believe that if Nigeria were a serious country, by this time, Bulkachiwa should be interrogated, should be writing statements, should have even been invited by our law enforcement agencies. The police should have been interested in this. I understand the NBA president has written a letter, even though the position of the NBA, as far as I'm concerned, does not sufficiently address the issue. But how come that we haven't even seen Shehu, we have not seen invitation to Bulkachiwa, the confessor. But, but Nobody you, has invited but, him. But you said that. To even explain but, but you said what that, he has said. But you said he was covered by law yeah. for whatever he says on the floor. Yes, he's covered regarding what he said on the floor. But he's not covered regarding what he did outside the floor. Which he only spoke to while in the floor. I tried to draw that distinction. So it can be investigated. It, so it, it can be investigated. Absolutely, because what he spoke about on the chambers of the Senate took place possibly in the room, in the matrimony affair. So I mean, uh, um, uh, if, if that, uh, that can be investigated, Mister Mr. Effion. So for 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 the sake of our of our listeners, our viewers on this podcast, I mean, this is not really our line of conversation tonight but i think it's also very important for us to touch on it because it touches on the very nerve of the core that holds our society which is justice and the role of the judiciary now for a lot of people who may not understand the magnitude of the kind of statements senator bukuchu are made there are different kinds of statement that could be made as uh, as evidence that could be led in evidence in a court of law a confessional statement for example it is what lawyers will say that is enough to prove a matter so i mean am i right or wrong uh, mr inibe if, if you can if you can help us here if someone makes a confessional statement i mean what but how does the law seize it in terms of evidence that can be well, under the Evidence Act of 2011, a confession is defined as a statement made by a person stating or suggesting or suggesting the inference that he committed an offense. But let me read to you the provisions of Section 1 of the Legislative Houses Powers and Privileges Act. It states that, I quote, a criminal or civil proceeding shall not be instituted against a member of a of the legislative house 
in respect of words spoken or written at the plenary session or at a committee proceedings of the legislative house. I believe you got that clearly. Mm -hmm. He said a criminal or civil proceeding shall not be instituted. This is the immunity that is agreeable that in us to members of parliament. It is not only in Nigeria, it is a global thing, right? Parliamentary immunity, the concept of parliamentary immunity it has always been there. What is however problematic is the abuse. Because so we even, but even within the confines, it is all that this was you know, their last session, because ordinarily, even the Senate would have had power to investigate the comment he made. I am saying that the words he spoke about what he said in law, right, tends to suggest that he had engaged in perversion of justice. So, Mr. But I also highlighted Mr. that yeah, you Mr. cannot prosecute him many on the basis of those words. Yeah. So, Mr. Anibe... You can't pass charges basis on those words. Yeah. You must put actions to those words. So, and I wanted, need evidence to do that. Yeah, I, I wanted to us, I wanted you to educate us and let us know on a normal day, if Senator Bukachua is not covered by legislative immunity, if he said what he said outside of the parliament, how weighty is a confessional statement? Can we regard what he said as a confessional statement? If you make a confessional statement, what does it mean in law on a particular allegation or a crime? Well, ordinarily by law, a confession uh, is the best piece of evidence. <laughs> it's a singular evidence upon which the court can grant conviction without having to have recourse to other kinds of evidence, whether direct evidence or circumstantial evidence, conventional statements is enough to grant conviction. The question therefore becomes, can this really be described as a confessional statement? Because when you confess to a crime, say who, mm. the confession, the words that you have uttered, either in writing or spoken, must be such that is cogent, must be such that has clarity regarding the offense itself. He spoke generally. He said some of his colleagues were beneficiaries of this. He did not somehow mention any particular of his colleague. But I believe, I want to be understood clearly so that I will not be misquoted. I believe that based on what he has said, I don't believe that charges can be filed, a competent charge can be filed to say, oh, that you, Senator Bukachiwa, on the floor of the Senate on so, so and so day, did utter the following words and thereby committed an offense. I don't think that a child can be framed in that manner. But what, however, can happen is that based on what he has said, if we were a serious country that has strong clinical, forensic, investigative mechanisms, there should be a process or a system where the state, the government, will be interested in determining whether truly what he has said took place and who the beneficiaries were and what cases these influences may have taken. Because he has already recanted. While you are asking me this question, I, I believe you are aware, he has recanted. He has tried to retract what he has said to say, oh, uh, Lawan did not allow me to conclude on what I wanted to say. Oh, I was misunderstood. He's trying to work back on what he said. So that is why it would be difficult for what he said to hold up in court, for a charge to be framed merely on the basis mm. of that. Right. Which is why the police should have said, okay, we are not, we may not charge you based on what he said on the floor of the Senate because of legislative immunity. Right? Even though I believe the court may want to see whether there are exceptions to that immunity. All right. However, because you have said this, is it possible to review the cases political cases in particular that were determined during the tenure of your wife, the retired honorable president of the Court of Appeal. This is the angle that I had thought the National Judicial Council will look into. Again, regrettably, Shemu, my lord, the retired president of the Court of Appeal, my lord honorable Justice Bukachiwa, has retired. He's no longer a judicial officer. And to that extent, the NJC no longer has the jurisdiction to investigate her. I believe that is a lot to do. Once the judicial officer has retired, the NJC no, may no longer be able to investigate. Okay. But however, while they may not investigate my laws directly, they are actionable 
things that the NJC can do that the police can do. All right. Because so, yeah. So I mean, because I, I I want us to quickly come back. There there is one matter that I want us to touch on before we get people talking, and I, I want us to do it quickly. Let me come to uh, Mr. Ogunamisi, then we'll come back to um, Mr. Uh, Nwokolo. Uh, Mr. Ogunamisi, the sack of, uh, uh, the suspension rather, and the arrest of Mr. Bauer and Mr. Emefiele, these two actions uh, relating to issues of, I mean, they, they have issues have to do with our economy and what the president, the decision the president has made. In your own view, how do you assess it? Uh, thanks. I think the, the president in his wisdom would have uh, more information that ordinarily would not be available to us. But based on, you know, when you just gauge the public opinion, you see particularly the sack of uh, the, the suspension of the CPM governor seems to have been met with um, uh, excitement by larger, larger members of the society. And that's probably due to the impact of the currency change on the larger populace. So it, it would seem like the, uh, the president seems to have demonstrated that he's able to act where there are suspicion, suspicion of corruption or what have you. But my only grouse is that um, it is important that whatever petition or whatever crime they, they might have committed should be made available to the public so that this is not going to be perceived as um, uh, maybe the new government which aren't people they don't like in government. It's important to be transparent. It's important they allow the, the accused persons to have legal representation, access to their legal representations, their family members. So I think it's a it's a move that is welcome generally, mm -hmm. and I think coupled with the monetary policy, I think it's it's just it's a bit um, yes, you know sometimes something about performative activism that we've always done in our country is it doesn't give us the it doesn't give us the opportunity for a cool headed um, uh, uh, way of looking for solutions for our problems. Say for example, if a government seems to have demonstrated sign of Sense of sense that they 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 are trying to do the right thing, and it's important we we give them the credit for that and encourage them to continue on that pathway. While it's also important that we should be a watchdog to make sure that they don't abuse that power. So I think the suspension of both power and the CBN governor is is in order, but it needs to be it needs to the government needs to be clear. They need to be transparent, yeah. and it's also important that the government in their going forward should uh sort of communicate you know whatever they have against these people and and um uh, and, and dispense you know justice delayed is justice denied mm. so uh, remember they are they are innocent until found guilty the historical perspective to all of these there have been five or so former chairman uh or chair persons in the efcc none of them have been able to use uh use the the time uh prescribed by law uh, yeah. finish their terms from the days of Nuru Badu uh, to Lamode to Farida Waziri uh, to uh, Magu and now this young man who is just about 42 years old who's just spent about <laughs> two years in office uh, none of them have is like a, a, a musical chair keeps moving and sit, um, it keeps uh, uh, pulling people off uh, that they sit but then uh, within the security sector Mr. Wokolo what kind of signal do you think these two decisions of President Tunubu had raised? So, um, let me even start from that of um, Mr. Bauer. Look at when he was announced as the chairman of EFCC. There were a lot, a lot of allegations against him, which in, in countries where things work very well, there was no way he would have even been be confirmed in any way. You know, those allegations still came up sometime uh, three or four weeks ago when the, either the House of Representatives, the Ninth Assembly, or we are asking the former Minister of Justice to account for uh, stolen crew that were so, sold in Port Harcourt by this Mr. Bauer. So, if, in, in, in countries where people know that public office 
is not for you to go there and enrich yourself. For the mere fact that your name is being associated with things that are not worthy, you will not even accept the position. But it's not the same thing here. Now, if you try to look at this from security perspective, now the question is, you know, like EFCC as, as, as you know, as a an organization that is there to look at economic and financial crime, of which if they are actually working very well, some of these things we are talking about all your theft, they would have investigated it and be, you know, uh, alongside the EF, the DSS and be informing the president. But situation where is about chasing small boys who are carrying computer around and leaving the big animal to break through the cobweb and go away. They will continue to falter and continue not to deliver. So that's what you'll see. Now, in terms of the economy, the economy has a way of impacting so much on security. You know, that's why in countries where the economy is organized very well, you know, that level of poverty are being reduced, you find out that it impacts the way security issues are dealt with, especially if you're reducing poverty and drivers of violence or drivers of conflict, especially the ones that are linked to e economic issues or uh, economic disempowerment, because you've been able to liberate your economy in such a way that it works for, for all and sundry, you find out that things are working very well. Now, use the case of when we try to do the Naira swap, the change of the currency, what happened, you know? Now, it doesn't equally negate the fact that there were some issues or some policies taken by uh, former Governor Nefele or still Governor Nefele who is suspended that has equally impacted positively on the economy, especially when it comes to... Um, um, transferring money and all that, you find out that the way the CBN in the last eight years or four, five, six years have been able to make people um, do less of cash, cash, you know, carrying cash around and do more of transfers has reduced, somehow reduced, you know, Violent, violent crime that has to do with people busting into people's home trying to steal money. However, it has translated to other forms of insecurity too. You know? So, these things are the things right. where you find out mm -hmm. there's a way you deal with them. Right. You, you try to set up an economic policy, but you try to find out how could it impact negatively on the security situation in the country as well. Let me get a few people, and I, I like to get quite a, a few number of people on Twitter Spaces to uh, to weigh in on what you have said. But I will plead that you make it very sharp, very succinct, and straight to the point. And I like to uh, start with. Uh, I see some hands up uh, at Ibirogba two thousand um, at ABC on Twitter on Twitter Spaces. If you are ready, uh, your mic is on, please. Good afternoon, Shil. Good, uh, afternoon. good afternoon to all you. Uh, brilliant speakers in house. I've listened carefully, and to be honest with you, uh, I think everybody spoke uh, to the truth in a way, you know. However, for me, my own summation is quite simple. Majority of this issue boils down to lack of patriotism. You know, when the people are not patriotic, you will just keep, they will just keep running rat race around you. You know what I mean? You know, so you talk, now we talk about military. I'm just speaking to the oil theft issue. I'm not addressing Bawa and MFL. DSS will take care of that one. You know, so, but for the oil theft, you will see that by the time you accuse the military, then you come back, you accuse the community, then you come back, you accuse the oil in, uh, industry people, you know, and all. Of, and the whole thing is just a big, big gamut, a big is issue on ground. But for me, I think the best person that can also address is still the pres current president. He has shown a little bit of um, that he can, he can, he can with the big stick. One thing that uh, I supported President Buhari, however, but 
Uh, I, 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 one thing I know about him is that he, he didn't wait, wait the big stick. He couldn't sack. He couldn't fire. He couldn't do all of those things. So now, with the way the president has shown that, yes, I'm ready. I'm here to. I'm on ground. I can sack. I can fire. I can do all of this. I think that will send the big signal. When he first met with the uh, uh, service chief, I when they were interviewing, I think or I watched on channels or so, they, they were interviewing this the head of the service chief, and they asked him that what did he, what what the, was discussed with the president. And he, he, the first thing he mentioned was that they, they gave them a mandate to go and secure, I mean, to go and combat uh, oil theft. So that tells me something that hmm, I think this president is is very playing very smart, you know, giving the military service chief the order go. Uh, combat oil theft, then somebody coming from that region to come and speak to the whole world indirectly, you know, that this is, this is the, uh, the oil, the service chief, I mean, no, the, the, some military people are culpable in this regard. So I think uh, somebody is trying to speak to them, to, to the conscience of the military to be able to mm. uh, sit up on their job. Thank yeah. you very much. Shane. So you, you, you think it's a wake up call. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, to be rugby, I appreciate it. So let, let's get another person uh, on Twitter Spaces uh, to coming into the conversation. I see Ugo. Um, um, yeah. Okay, who, who is on here? Hansen, Hansen, Hansen is online, sir. Okay, okay, please go ahead, Hansen. Yeah, on a quick one, eh, you know, some of these things, eh, we, we tend to see it as a very big issue. It's actually not a very big issue. The reasons are obvious because we live in a country where basic things of life are not available we live in a country where people appreciate people who has means of making things without the basic realities what i'm trying to say is is this now basic things you can't have a situation where we've been calling for oil theft in years i mean i'm a student of the training institute in worry is what i read in school we have buyers we have sellers the moment you have buyers, you have sellers, then it's as good as done. What are we not talking about? Who are those people stealing? Who are those people buying? We know them as a country. We know them as a people. We know them in Niger Delta. What Asari said is the reality. But it's also a culprit. Let's not make no mistake about these old things. So now that everybody is now in the front burner, can we be sincere to ourselves? In as much as we will fail in the basic of this whole thing, which is the electoral reform, which ought to be the silver bullet that would have catapulted Nigeria to a place where everybody will say, yes, this is a country of our own. We failed in it. You can't fail in, uh, fail in B and expect to pass in C and D. It's not possible. Let's be sincere to ourselves. We want this whole thing done. And we are all Nigerians. We have right to this whole thing. If I can see somebody stealing in Abuja, somebody stealing in Lagos, why can't I steal in Niger Delta? Why can't somebody steal in, in Southeast? That's the issue. So, first, we need to realize and tell ourselves the truth we are all Nigerians. Let's be on the table to discuss this issue. Mm. We have buyers, we have sellers. Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Anson. Let me get another person. Ugoji is on. Ugoji Ebujo, please go ahead. Your mic is on. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will dwell on the crude theft. Most people don't understand the terrain and they don't understand the business. And that is why they make light of Asari Dokobo's revelations. To, to move in a barge or a vessel for bunkering, you get a never permit. Is, is that bad? Yes, chiefs might be involved, youth might be involved, everybody might be involved, but this thing is coordinated by the military. Hmm. The same military that exists to stop it the idea of a military protecting the, the the security of the country, lives, and the territorial integrity, to protect the lives of the country, lives of people in the country, what do you do is to protect the power base and to protect the wealth. I have to be strategic. So you pick where is the wealth concentrated. So to find a military that cannot protect the oil installation, and we're not talking about... See, People mix it up. We're not talking about vandalizations. We're talking about grand theft. We're not talking about minor theft. We're not talking about the people taking small overnight. We're talking about big, huge tankers. Theft in trillions of territorial water. Yes. To collect huge volumes of crude oil. And
And the length of the dike is an open space in the air. What that means is that it's not like the southeast. A helicopter goes up, it sees everything. So once a helicopter goes up, it sees all the badges, it sees all the vessels, it sees the ones in the right places, it sees the ones in the wrong places. The Navy has naval intelligence. I won't say too much. They, these things are coordinated. There's a racket. And the racket didn't start now. It's been on. So mm -hmm. somehow, there's a culture of corruption and the infrastructure of corruption has been built. So what Asari said, no, and it's not a question of whether Asari has taken part or not, or whether he's bad or good. That's not the issue now. The issue now is that the country is in peril. Mm -hmm. And to come out of where we are, right. we must stop this. All to right. stop it, right. we must install a different infrastructure and mindset. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Agujo, for, for your intervention. Olu at Emperor 24, uh, you're up next and your mic is on. Please go ahead. Your quick intervention. Yeah, good evening. Space from UK. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, discussing, everybody has spoken well. Yeah, I'm listening. Uh, she, what we are discussing is uh, beyond uh, cartel. Is beyond cartel. Uh, I've been on this. Uh, it's not the first time we're hearing of uh, bunkery, smuggling, and all this. It's beyond cartel. Yeah, the Kubo mention of ministry and navy. It's not only ministry and navy. There are cartels like a mafians that some uh, we are looking at. Is somebody? Uh, yeah, federal government can deal with it. No, it's beyond. Because the people that are in the sector of the security are the one responsible responsible for everything. I'm into shipping. Before a ship uh, gets to the west coast, it's already navigated just like like a plane. You want to land, you have to give a signal uh, by border by border. It's the same. So where are these bunker? It's not even a ship. It's bigger than ship. Where are these bunker of crude oil? Passed from the west coast, uh, from the west uh, ocean there, uh, Ghana, Tema, from Tema to Togo, from Togo to this uh, before you get to Nigeria territory. So where are the security of navies? Where are the security of uh, army? Our borders that we place there. But if a NDLA can trace a, a vessel that contain a, a, a drug, so well, what are the who are they fooling? In, in fact, now, all the Navy's officers and all these, their boss, their, their regulation number, uh, letters are supposed to submit on the desk of the president, as I'm talking right now. This is why I said, Shane, this thing is beyond cartel. If they reveal the secret, uh, the people that are behind this, you will be surprised, you will be shaken. So what is going to happen? We are not going to, if the Mr. President wants to deal with this, we can't deal with it with the violent. Dakubo, I don't trust uh, uh, Azari Dakubo. That, uh, why? I'm sorry. He has been there. He has given a chance for several years. Uh, how many thieves, how many uh, 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 pipes, secret pipes have you revealed to Nigerians? They give it, um, what's the guy, 34 billion naira contract to Tambolo. It's not even three months they gave that money. You can see from TV here and there, in China TV, NTA, even private uh, television going there to reveal so many guys uh, eating, uh, eating pipes linked to the national pipes that said good oils. So Azari Dakubo can go to anywhere, can go uh, to Abuja, even beyond the cab. I will not listen to him because he has been given that chance right. for so many years without revealing anything to us. Mm. So, uh, the Tombolo have done well. I trust them below more than uh, as I, why am I mentioning them? Ah, you are not beyond them because they are more powerful. They are they are below. They belong to cartel as well. You can't rubbish them. They are very important in this in this grace now. We can't do it alone. Right. It's beyond cartel. We need to sit tight for to to bring out a solution. Thank, thank, thank you. So, you. Th thank you so much, Olu at um, Emperor Twenty Four. Um, up next, uh, Sena uh, Lebade Aguado at Stardust Six underscore sixty six. If you are up. Please, uh, your mic is on. Your quick intervention. Okay. Good evening, Shemu, and good evening, Nigerians. Good evening. Uh, I want to speak on this uh, issue of um, oil theft. Uh, I think a couple of years back, a thief broke into my house and stole one or two things. I took the matter to the Nigerian police. Before I could finish narrating the story, 
a particular policeman mentioned that it was done by so 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 person. They investigated and found him with my properties. What am I saying? That the Ni Nigerian security forces and the Nigerian state have the capacity to stop a lot of crime. The information they get, uh, whatever they are exposed to, is to a large extent sufficient for them to stop several crimes from happening. So I, I am inclined to believe uh, uh, Dokubo on his allegations that the military is involved in this. Because when you look at uh, the scope and the scale of the crime of oil theft, I think there's no way anybody can steal that amount of oil from Nigeria without the involvement of the state and without complicitness of uh, the military. And then I may disagree with him on the uh, percentage, saying 99, because oil theft has been in existence even before it got to this cancerous level. And since we have uh, some political scientists in the house, I would like to throw in this theory of uh, regulatory capture, regulatory capture theory. And I think um, what has happened to Nigeria in the case of oil theft, uh, the Bauer, the dismissal of EFCC chairman and other things, is a case of uh, the regulator being captured by the person he is meant to regulate. And so instead of regulating the person, the state ends up uh, performing the functions that promote the interest of that person he's meant to regulate. Right. Be it security mm -hmm. forces, be it EFCC, and so on and so forth. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, let's get another person uh, on the microphone. Um, at Munelo, Engineer Munelo, if you are ready, a quick intervention. Thank, thank, thank you very much. You know, I want to look at um, Bawa on the topic. And I want to look at it from the perspective of Nigerian youth. You know, um, this discussion during the campaign, people talk about the old people who are ruling us and destroying, <coughs> excuse me, destroying our country. But fortunately, I have seen that even the youths, when they have opportunity, some stories come out that are not palatable. Somebody said here, I think it was Mr. Wokolo, that said when he was to be confirmed, after his name was submitted to the Senate, issues were raised against him that ordinarily shouldn't have allowed him to be to be screened uh, or to, 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 to succeed from Senate. But somehow he came in and look at the story coming up now. He reminds me also of uh, Abakia, a young man who everybody was still doing well at the end of the day, what is the story today? The story today. Now, it tells, it, it, this talks about the mindset of even those of us who are youth, who are supposed to be above board to be doing the right thing. But unfortunately, sometimes these are the stories we hear. We all have to just look at our country and take a decision to, to, to change the narrative. We talk about oil, oil, with, uh, oil theft today. The military people who have been accused now. They are youths. Majority of them posted to this, uh, uh, this, these places to protect the oil. Uh, they are youths. But look at the stories coming out. I just hope that this country, we, 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 we have a routine among ourselves and, and begin to do the right thing. Right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, I take about two more people and so that we can wrap up. Um, I have at uh, Bamiyinka 05, at Bamiyinka 05 on Twitter, uh, please, if you are uh, ready, please, we're listening. Right. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I just want to, I just want to quickly put a perspective as uh, as somebody who has worked in the industry on how oil theft really happens. Maybe that will help everybody uh, understand the discussion better. So uh, we all need to understand the layers, right? Oil companies have um, surveillance contractors who are community people. Who they pay so those ones do the um, low level ground throttling um, information collection and then they also have um, what we call the government security agents which are the military the navy which they also pay now the reason why it is easy for asari to say the military is responsible is because the box stops with the military 
But the real issue are not addressed. The real issue is that the payment, so much as the military actually gets salary from the government, but they also get some allowances um, from the oil companies for protecting um, the, the lines. Sometimes those allowances are not paid as at when due. And when you have a national duty and you are at a security post that you have a national duty, but there, there are a lot of security risks attached to it. And you have allowances that you're supposed to collect from oil companies who have contracts with you. And you don't fulfill those obligations. You also don't, the, the oil companies don't fulfill their obligations even to the surveillance contractors sometimes. The military sometimes, and I'm saying this from experience, choose most time to negotiate with the bunkers. You need to first understand that it 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 takes a lot of um, skill set for you to be able to bunker a line, and these guys get training. It's an industry. People get people get trained abroad. It, you get trained in 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 Holland because all tapping is actually a very big skill set. They get full training before they come and then do the all tapping and tap the crude. So it's a total package that involves everybody. The only reason why it's easy and it's convenient for everybody to put the whole blame at the door of the military is because when everything is done, the military is supposed to protect the border and protect, uh, making sure that the asset, the this oil don't leave. But unfortunately, like somebody have mentioned here, the terrain in, in the Niger Delta is so open that if you have a willing bar. All right, it appears that we, we, we lost uh, connection with, uh, with Bam. Let, let's take uh, we're at Onu Majuro 5, Real Mazi. And because they're already by uh, Okay, um... All right, go ahead. Then. Cool. So it's a complete system that needs addressing. And for it to actually, uh, for, it, for us to be able to attack it, the operators of the assets need to take some level of responsibility mm. Thank you because so yeah. the the security architecture starts with them not just the not just not just the military not just the federal government thank you so much indeed uh let's take real mazi and uh, it will be the one uh, wrapping it up for us on that on the twitter spaces here yeah. okay thank you Sherry. good evening all and uh I'm spacing from Moscow. Um, what I want to talk about is that um, talking about our aid test, the truth of the matter is this. Um, who is the Minister of Petroleum in Nigeria? That is Buhari. And he should be held responsible with all these mess going on. I wonder why we forget so soon that the same Minister of Petroleum was in office and all this mess was going on for a couple of years. Until a presidential candidate made a, a statement that OE theft is an organized crime going on in Nigeria. And that was when many people's eyes opened to this crime going on. And it seems as if nobody knows what was going on earlier before then. The trillions of upon trillions of naira are being theft in Nigerian court and, and Nigerians are really suffering. And these guys are packing this money under the nose of the same person that calls himself Mr. Integrity. And all these things happen. And when Tampolo made such, when Tampolo made the revelation, it happened. It come up like a breeze, and in space of few minutes, the thing ended, and that was the end of it. And I, 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 I start wondering what brings Asari Dokobo to Asrock. Somebody like Asari Dokobo, what brought him to the Asrock? A state of a nation being surrounded by corrupt people. And you call yourself a president, inviting Asari Dokobo to the Astro, even making him to make a speech with the coat of arm. What kind of impunity is that? Sometimes I wonder how, what, what kind of the reasoning we are having in this country. You, you call yourself a president, you invited a known terrorist. I don't know how to put it to the to the Astro to come and make a speech. Well, that is not my business. The point I'm trying to make is this. If you, if you like involve the military, if you like you don't involve the military, we all know what is going on. 
in the oil test. We all know what is going on there. I don't want to talk about the MFLA and the um, and the power of a case. What I want to talk about is that as long as the impunity going on in Nigeria did not stop, that which is going on will keep roving around. It will keep roving around. The INEC chairman was able to go to Chatham House to make a speech. He was able to come to the to, to this thing to make a speech as early as possible. But he had been invited by the tribunal. He couldn't honor the invitation to come and explain how he declared Tinubu the winner of the presidential election. He couldn't honor the invitation. Bukachua, if he's in a insane country, Bukachua should have been in jail by now. And we call Nigeria a country. So thank you uh, for thank this. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like us to wrap up quickly now. I'll go to uh, Mr. Inibe Epiong to get your final thought. And I'd like you to anchor on the issue of Mr. Bauer's suspension and that of the Mayfield and their arrest. There are a lot of people who have different views and all this is going. But in your own view, three weeks of uh, uh, Tenobu's presidency, how would you rate it? movement and action or action without movement or what are your views on a final uh, note mr Enibe? well very, very quickly on a mafia layer uh, his removal was uh, widely welcome because irrespective of one's political leaning i think we can all agree that no serious country will return as the head of his uh, central bank a man who had gotten himself a mesh in, uh, in partisan politics, a man who had indicated interest to run for president, a man who had uh, basically uh, undermined the institutional integrity and independence of the, of the CBN. Uh, CBN is supposed to set our monetary policies as a country. Uh, so when you have such a person shrouded in such political scandal, you basically you know, do not have a CBN. So a mafia less removal, uh, I think, is justifiable. Uh, the motive for same, whether right or wrong, for me is secondary. The one that I am more concerned about is Bauer. Uh, it is left to be seen whether Tinubu remove him because he wants to fight corruption, you know, more effectively. Tinubu did not make war against corruption a central. Uh, parts or piece of his campaign. He, 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 he didn't campaign on anti-corruption. He, he didn't say those who steal money will be dealt with. He did not speak passionately about dealing with the issue of corruption. So if uh, Bauer's removal is to enhance the war again, the fight against corruption, it, I, we, we, we should just wait and see while their investigation in court is ongoing, uh, what is going to become of the EFCC. I said that because currently we have our Senate President, my former Governor Akwabiu, uh, someone that has uh, investigation, is under investigation by EFCC. We have several political associates and members of the Tunubu Cabal, you know, not Cabal, but the people that we know are close to the ruling party that are very active and ongoing corruption cases. I want to see how those cases will fare. I, I want to see what will become of these investigations now that Bawa, the you know, the man that is now being painted as corrupt, has been suspended from office. And and also, uh, I think it is also important for us to look into his activities, really. Whether he, he was complicit, whether he had compromised, whether he had compromised himself, if the facts are established against him. It's not above the law. It should be prosecuted. We must, as a country, establish a culture of elevating institutions of both personalities. But in, in summary, I am saying that Tinubu's motives are questionable. Uh, however, one will just have to wait and see what is going to become of these two institutions, what the CBN will do differently, right? I have seen some reforms in monetary policy, for example, the issue of Forex, uh, the dollar exchange rate, in one bit, they are saying, oh, uh, they want to unify, if, if it is, if that is my understanding, they want to take away the disparity between the parallel market, the black market, and the official exchange rates. In other bit, is looking as if the CBN is still trying to regulate the exchange rates. So I don't really know what is happening yet, uh, but for whatever it is worth, for whatever it is worth, I agree with the MFLS suspension. That of our is the, the, 
the intention is left to be seen. No, but please let me mention this. I am also concerned that it is the state security service that is handling these investigations. Let us not be distracted, Shehu. Nigerians are very easily distracted. And that is why our leaders get away with murder. The SSS that illegally refers itself to, to itself as DSS, which is actually SSS by virtue of Section 3 of the National Security Agencies Act, does not have a very commendable record of uh, investigating cases like this which results in conviction or in a reasonable conclusion. I can cite for you several examples. What the SSS has basically become over the years is a political tool in you know in the hands of whoever occupies the seat of the villa. It has become a political tool to achieve political agenda. I don't understand what the allegations against the CBA governor is. He cannot be prosecuted for Naira redesign policy. Whoever is expecting that tomorrow this, the federal government will charge a mafia for trying to change the Naira or redesigning the Naira. It's, not, it's just wasting you our time. That is impossible because that itself is not a crime. You cannot criminal, criminalize the policy. But if they are speaking to misappropriation of funds or money that we meant for printing of new notes, uh -huh, I will understand. But the policy itself, because it looks like many supporters of Tinubu are happier over a mafialist removal, not because he's corrupt. I want them to prove me wrong. Not because of his, you know, uh, uh, previous action. Because this same MFLA, the same APC people that are supporting his suspension today, when MFLA had the account of the uh, key supporters of the NSAS illegally frozen, they clapped for him. When MFLA went after, you know, uh, some, some policies that were quite controversial, blockchain and so on cryptocurrencies that were very controversial they applauded it but it was until until mefeles political leaning yeah. tend to have affected tunubu that they became angry so if the genuine motive because something may be good but if the intention behind it is bad the end may still be bad if the removal of a mefele is to serve the country better let the charges be put forward i heard something about terrorism financing I don't know what that means. If he's being accused of financing terrorism, who are these terrorists that he financed? What are their names? Malamito lost that 400 persons were identified by the federal government for sponsoring terror. Sunubu has been occupying the office of, uh, you know, uh, 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 has been in the villa for, for, for how many days now? We are still waiting for the names to be disclosed. So is there a connection between the MFLA and those 400 names? I do not know. What are the charges against him? What are the facts against him? Let these facts be put forward. I don't want the situation where we will come back seven, six months from now, we are still mm. talking about the MFLA yeah. and no serious charges before mm. the court. We are still talking about Bawa. How about the spirit says so? Mago. That Buhari had... Mago. So when we get the easily justice, distracted. The justice they told us Mago was corrupt. They had him investigated. They had him detained. So when, what has happened to Mago? Nothing. This is the point I am making. If the motive is not genuine, we might just see another rigma road. And I hope the Nigerians will not be put through that torturous journey again. Mm. Let us not be played with again. If this is about fighting corruption, I want to see how Tunubu will start with people in Buhari's government, right? Ministers to the highest level, people that were involved in corruption, including those who, are, who may have contributed money to his campaign. Nigerians are waiting to see ex-governors who, his, his, who supported his candidacy that have active corruption cases. Nigerians want to see what the FCC will do to them. If these things are not done, we would have just wasted you know, our time. They would have just wasted our time as a country. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Enebe. Let's get uh, the final thought of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kaude Ogunamisi. Your final thought on uh, on, on the podcast tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, mine is just to first congratulate Nigerians, you know. I may say I thought that after this last election, Nigeria was going to burn down if a particular candidate does not win an election or certain regions were going to make the country ungovernable. But the 
the will and the 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 the, the, the power of the Nigerian people to come together despite our differences to make sure that we we let losing candidates go to court to go and um, sort themselves out uh, is what is keeping us going. We don't have a perfect country, but um, we look at uh, uh, places like Sudan, where they've been uh, positions were encouraged to storm, storm the streets and make the country ungovernable, just to make a point. And today, uh, you have millions of people in Sudan in exile trying to survive. You look at um, uh, places like Libya and Iraq, uh, so that we should always know that no matter the imperfections in our country, we need to uh, make government responsible through legal means, through lawful means, and that where we have crisis, where we have problems, we, we should resolve it in a peaceful way. Mm. I'd also want to say that I am pleasantly surprised by the performance of, uh, well, by the actions of uh, Atinumbu, President Tinubu thus far for someone who did not um, vote for him during this election. I hope it continues, and I hope I hope he shatters a course of transparency, uh, respect for the rule of law, and uh, become a corrective administration. You know, no matter how bad or how how worse you think Buhari uh, was, he laid some foundation in in terms of infrastructure. He laid some foundation in 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 other areas. The kind of the, the reforms, even the electoral act we are talking about, were, that we've been trying to pass all through these years, uh, came about under Buhari. The petroleum act, you know, that. Um, um, and from a passenger to Jonathan, activists were shouting their heads, but nobody listened to them. Under Buhari, it got passed. So I want this government to consolidate on those good areas. And there are quite a number of failures like insecurity. I want this government to focus on insecurity, uh, focus on making life better uh, for Nigerians through corrective terms. And I also want to call on non-governmental organizations. It is important that when you're trying to find a solution to Nigeria's problem, you, you put off your partisan... Uh, uh, your partisan are uh, both in the media and NGOs and what have you that uh, there are sometimes we will need to agree to disagree and put our country first and put our partisan cap behind because when uh, uh, when you look at it from a partisan perspective you never get a thorough solution to a crisis at the end of the day when uh, terrorists blow up people. They don't ask them whether they are members of APC, Labour Party, or PDP, or they don't ask whether this individual is Yoruba, Igbo, Nupe, or, or Aousa. Uh, and so I just want to, I'm, I'm quite hopeful for our country because it's defied every prediction from naysayers that we are, we, we, we are going to be doomed. But uh, we should continue to uh, keep a watch on, on our political leaders. And also, Nigerians Nigeria is the way it is because Nigerians are, Nigeria is not just an entity in space. Uh, uh, it is not the president of the country or the governor or the councillor that is collecting bribe on the streets uh, or a lawyer that is um, uh, advocating for a corrupt politician or corrupt public officer. Uh, uh, we as a people must also uh, uh, be committed to leading by example as we call on our leaders to uh, rightly also uh, lead so it, it's it's a contribution that we must all come together and um, and liberate our country uh, and wherever we see individuals trying to push us to the kind of crisis where uh, uh, what I call conflict premiers would make enough money mm -hmm. to get out of the country we should it's our responsibility to to resist them as as we also uh, hold government to account thank right. you so thank you so much do you have any last uh, final word yeah um Two things. First, to say that um, President Tinibu is a president now that is trying to build legitimacy. So, considering where President uh, Buhari left the country, whatever action he takes, no matter how minute it is, will bring some positivity, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Again, is it again is equally important for us to understand that um, the eight years of President Buhari resulted in a lot of elite capture around a lot of things in the country. And we all understand that this is a country where elite consensus is very low. So you are, we are now having new sets of elites who probably, like I see it, are on the other side when President Buhari um, was the sheriff, trying to displace people who could have added one way or the other 
the elite on the side of President Buhari. And that's what we're saying. I know that um, President Tinubu has the, like we all know, the strategy to rule the country. He's a very smart man. And however, um, when it comes to things like this, there are things you take easy because you don't want to rush. You just want to understand everything because you need to do a lot of political settlement. That's what we call political settlement in political science. That means where you're trying to make sure that you carry everybody along, mm -hmm. you know? So it's quite important. And while you, you're doing this, it is really important that he should, as a matter of honesty, look at our security crisis and situation. Mm -hmm. What are those political security issues that the country at this period do not really need? We have, we have the army deployed in 34 out of the 36 states. And to be very honest, there are ones that all he needs to do is to show those people that, see, I am a new guy. I was not here the last eight years. I am here to move the country forward. I am here to list it. It's not, a part, it's not to say that the state has failed if the state decide to negotiate. In America, people negotiate. So when he looks at that, he might look at issues that are not, <clears throat> are not, are not um, um, in a nature where the people are trying to pull down the Nigerian state. All they want is to be recognized yeah. as citizens of the country. You know, I know he knows those cases. For people telling him, don't release this person, don't listen to him. We have less than 400 police officers. Our military are struggling. 400,000. 400, mm. Our military is currently struggling. So why don't we, why don't he sit down and listen to, cry, listen to cries of people who are only saying we want an inclusive government. Mm -hmm. That's all why we are fighting. Mm. And he goes to them. So you mean if I do this, do that, you will drop down your arms and they say yes. Mm. Please, President Tinibu, speak to them. It does not make you a weak president. Thank you so much, Dr. Undru Unwokolo, who is the team lead at next year SPD. Mr. Inibe Efiong, a lawyer and a rights activist. And Mr. Kaude Ogunda Misi, a political uh, analyst who has been talking with us from London. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your intervention and everyone who has intervened on Twitter Spaces and all of the platforms where You've been listening and watching these podcasts where there is enough blame to go around and we've been made to understand that we are dealing with a culture of corruption, a tough nut to crack. It's a value chain and it seems like the chain of oil theft in Nigeria is a long and complex one, at least from submissions of my guests tonight. That being said, President Tunubu will be expected to solve this problem, a daunting task where his predecessors have failed, have failed. Well, to whom much is given, much is expected. He will also be expected to formulate policies to get Nigeria on the right track. Well, well designed, well thought out actions to put the country on the path of prosperity. Nigeria's problems are multifaceted, which is why we could not be but dive into issues of the judiciary. These issues cannot be covered in a day obviously in all public trust must be built and institutions must show accountability transparency and the will to serve the public it is never a one man's job but the box stops at the desk of the president and his team whose political will is crucial to solving these myriad of problems that's our with the cuttings of the podcast tonight until i see you next time i'm sure akim Aloy. It's Mac on Podcast, the platform for the independent mind. I'll see you again next time. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Mike on Podcast with Shayono Kimbaloy. Mike on Podcast for the independent mind.